The capture of Gibraltar was seen as a great victory by the Alliance, as it gave those with trading interests a foothold in the Mediterranean. With remarks coming from Britain that it was of great interest to the British to secure its trading, whilst disrupting its enemies. The rebuilding of the fortress began immediately, not only with the walls themselves, but the military strength, with the garrison being a suggestion. Uh, and, and looking as we do here through the mouth of fire, and I know it, it is difficult when you look across this in modern times and see all those buildings that are out there now, it's, it is difficult to imagine the glasses that was prepared and the inundation which, which flooded out the base of the glasses to make it difficult to cross. Uh, but that's the only way you're going to get land forces onto here to attack this side of town. As long as supplies can be brought in at that stage and we can maintain a garrison strength here that can self-support, bear in mind we've, once we've done away with that land join, everything we're going to receive is from the sea. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's got to be. And all the time way. this was being rebuilt, uh, the Spanish were sitting over in what is now San Rocky, uh, thinking we're well, going to be back quite soon didn't happen, the 12th siege came along and uh, within three months this was a very heavily fortified uh, position in Gibraltar and made it a very, very strong fort. It, it was, I mean, and at a later stage um, it was recognised how important this position was and a position was put to the Treasury to further enhance it for more modern weapons. Uh, that's why you see the level of defences that you see today, was because it, it, it received a, a cash injection from uh, from England to, to re, rebuild, strengthen and to fortify. The first attempt on the rock came within a month of Gibraltar's capture. Whilst the rebuilding continued, the British fleet had sailed to Morocco to resupply, when news came that the Grand French and Spanish fleet was sailing towards Gibraltar. Rook, along with his Anglo-Dutch fleet, raced towards the French and Spanish and met them in a ferocious naval battle off Malaga. Losses were heavy on both sides during the Battle of Velez Malaga, but sufficient damage was done to the invaders to prevent them from reaching their destination. With the Spanish War of Succession raging on across Europe, Gibraltar's strategic importance was being brought to the fore more than ever before. The 12th siege began in September 1704, almost a month after Gibraltar had been taken. Gibraltar was by then being defended by just over 2,000 Dutch, British, Austrian and pro hatsburg Spanish troops. The besieging force numbered almost four times as many, but despite the superior numerical advantage, it was the occupiers who were to hold the advantage, utilising Gibraltar's geographical, natural and ever-improving man-made fortifications. Geographically, Gibraltar is protected by steep cliffs to the north and on the east side. The west, where the town is situated, access could only be gained by a thin strip of land less than 120 metres in width. Prince George of Hesse used everything he could to his advantage, including the flooding of the majority of the land access. The area is where Laguna Estate now stands. Grand Battery, or the Wall of St. Bernardo, as it was formerly known, was heavily fortified with cannon, as were the areas immediately above the lagoon to the north. A bomb ship was also anchored off the Old Mole to provide mortar flanking fire from the west. Hesse's problems, however, were not only from the besieging forces. The British and Habsburg forces were also divided by political disputes, with the British Marines unhappy in the main to have had to stay behind when Rook had left the rock. This was most apparent in the dispute between the Marines Colonel Fox and Irish Colonel Nugent, whom Hess had appointed as Governor of Gibraltar. The French and Spanish lines were reinforced in early October 1704, and once siege lines and trenches had been prepared, the first attack came on the 24th of the same month. The besieging forces attacked and were able to breach San Pablo Bastion, now known as North Bastion, which in a quirky twist of fate saw both the newly appointed governor, Nugent, and the Marines Colonel Fox killed on successive days. Despite the breach, the Spanish and French forces were unable to land. With Hess increasingly short of all manner of support, word was sent to Admiral Leake, who was in Lisbon, and he immediately set sail for Gibraltar, bringing supplies and reinforcements. A notable incident came on the 11th of November 1704 when commander of the Spanish-French forces, Villadrias, was told of a way into Gibraltar via the east side. We've seen on the western side of Gibraltar man-made structures but nothing like Mother Nature on this side. There was no way really of breaching the defences on this side, Pete. 
Not back then, not back then. I mean, it was long recognised that the defences on this side were, as you say, natural. The precipice, as you can see, running along the top, deemed almost unclimbable for its day. That said, it didn't stop uh, an attempt being made uh, in October of 1704, uh, when the Spanish had besieged Gibraltar to take it back. Uh, they sent a party of 500 soldiers uh, this way. Uh, their intention was to come in behind the garrison, timed with an attack from the front by other troops, they would come in from behind the garrison and surprise them. And when you look at the, the sheer magnitude of trying to get over the top of the rock from this side, it's pretty much impenetrable. Well, it's good you say that because, I mean, the thought of moving 500 men <laughs> unseen from the Spanish lines on that side the story goes that they hit a path on the south side, which means they've got to get under this. They've got to get all the way to the south undetected, uh, led by a Spanish goat herd called, uh, I believe it's called Simon Suzarte, was then to make their way up and over the top of the rock and spend the night in St. Michael's Cave, which is allegedly what they did. Then um, the following day to move forward, scale Charles V wall and take the guard out at Signal House and at Middle Hill before setting up to attack the town. They were, they were spotted, basically. 160 uh, men were lost as a result of it. The, a party of grenadiers were sent up and the engagement saw 160 dead. Um, a lot of them thrown down this side, apparently, uh, from the top, uh, or falling this side. Uh, the colonel, 30 officers and the remainder of the party taken prisoner. With the initial 500 attacking forces repelled, the remaining 1,500 troops who were set to attack the following morning returned to their lines. Admiral Leake's 20 strong fleet sailed into the bay that very same day, and the ensuing naval battle saw seven of the French ships destroyed, thwarting a potential attack on the fortress. Whilst Admiral Leake had brought some supplies and men, it was the skilled manpower that was to prove the most effective. A force of around 500 was assembled and major repairs were set about to the fortifications, remounting of the guns and hauling of the guns up the rock to increase the firepower on the Spanish positions. One thing that is very noticeable as we go through the different stages of wall and the different countries that built them is the craftsmanship that went into the British walls, uh, very different to what was already there at the Wall of St Bernard. Uh, absolutely, uh, and very common to anywhere you go where the Brits are defending, you'll see exactly the same kind of defensive uh, positions crafted in exactly the same way in Malta uh, in UK as you find in Gibraltar and, and these embrasures do exactly that they, they give an excellent example of that coupling in with the fire steps in between you get a exactly what, what we've had uncovered here shows you how we can have the cannon in the embrasure manned by its crew and then muskets on the top of the wall, so you've got the, the raised area of the banquette or the fire step for the infanteers or other soldiers to get on to give musket fire over the top. One of the main players in this activity was a certain Captain Willis, whose name is seen around Gibraltar, most notably Willis's Road. For much of the remainder of the 12 seas, the pattern of bombardment and counter-bombardment continued. Further reinforcements, numbering over 2,000, arrived in December 1704, and refortification continued. The besieging forces were by now facing more problems than that which were inside Gibraltar. The desperate state of affairs reached the French courts with Louis XIV dispatching Marshal to test with 4,500 French and Irish troops. Villadrius made one last attempt before de Hesse's arrival on the 7th of February. But although his attack with 1,500 men on the Round Tower, which is situated above Laguna Estate, was successful, the success was short-lived and the attacking forces were again repelled. De Tess arrived in late February and morale of the Spanish and French forces was further raised when 18 French men of war under Admiral de Jean sailed into the bay. The Gibraltar garrison went on immediate alert expecting an attack from the south, but this failed to occur. Admiral Leake had returned with a fleet of some 35 ships of mixed origin. The battle in the strait proved the final straw of the siege, with both attacking forces blaming each other for the failure. De Tess withdrew back to France while Villadrias resumed sole command and converted from siege to blockade. That's all for this week. Coming up next week, we build up to the Great Siege, looking at the Treaty of Utrecht, the 13th Siege, as well as a further look 
for the fortifications of Gibraltar and the ever-changing face of weapons used during the time. 